Hello and welcome to the Odd Couple Podcast. This is Siddharth here. And I am Dr. Sheesh. So recently we came across this historical site right in our backyard, well within the borders of our urban city of Bengaluru. And what was more interesting was the fact that there were more of them scattered across the city as well as India. Surprisingly, most of us don't know anything about these buildings, which were of significant importance at a time when India was just a land of villages and princely states, and the idea to map India had just begun under the name of the Great Trigonometrical Survey. And all this was way back in 1830s. Yes, you heard it right, 1830s. That was before we had railways, or even before a calculator was invented. This intrigue further led us to our prestigious guest today, Mr. Udaya Kumar. Mr. Udaya is a passionate Bengalurian and a citizen historian conservationist. He loves to research lesser known aspects of the city's history. He is currently working to secure and build more awareness about Bengaluru's incredible inscription stones, which we hope to talk in detail at a later episode. He has a master's in engineering mechanics from IIT Madras and has worked with Tata, General Electric and Schneider Electric. Mr. Udaya was recognized as Namma Bengaluru Citizen Individual of the Year 2019 for his work in the area of heritage conservation in Bengaluru. He is now the Honorary Director for the 3D Inscription Digital Conservation Project of the Mythic Society. Welcome to the Odd Couple Podcast, Mr. Udaya. So glad to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a big uh, deal for me to talk about this favorite topic. So, sir, my God, I'm so glad we finally got you on the show. We've literally stalked you for the last month <laughs> or so, you know, ever since we got to hear about this uh, little uh, building right in our backyard. But also was very intriguing the fact that this term associated with you, the accidental historian you know and it's very weird to to hear somebody passing out of uh, iit and then becomes a historian tell us a little about a bit about you know what got you into this and how you you became a historian yeah um <laughs> it's a tough one um and a lot of people have been typecast in terms of an iit and or an engineer or someone else and all of that but at heart we are all basically people who love Uh, you know wherever we stay we kind of think of certain places as home right so in you're partly right in that i had very little interest in history like a lot of people it meant mostly um, you know names of kings and dynasties and a lot of years and numbers to remember so um, not exactly my favorite subject i wasn't a great one with memory i'm not a great one with uh, and i had remembering things either However, what happened was that there was always this interest in this city, Bengaluru, my home. And um, some point in, um, you know, some point that interest turned into uh, learning, exploring the past of the city itself. You know, while you understand the contemporary city, you know, you know all the roads, you know all the bars, and you know all the pubs, and you know all the rest of it. Uh, there's more to the city, and uh, slowly you get to learn, hear about it, and all of that. So the first. Um, experience with history in the sense that you said was this you know topic we are discussing the great trigonometric survey of india so how it started was an accident we there was this program in uh, you know the bmrcl auditorium at mg road the topic of that discussion was something called uh, bangalore the past in the present or something like that and there were four very uh, eminent people in that very um, i would say a charged discussion about the atara kacheri the high court building Uh, the discussion was about in the um, 80s there was a plan to raise that building and rebuild a new structure there and the idea was um, they said no this old looking colonial building is not holding up fine it's very old structurally weak so we need to raise it and rebuild it and um, strangely they said we'll rebuild it in the same way that it looks right now okay so it went through all those you know they wanted to build a multi story building then they said we'll rebuild the same thing and all of that the two people who were very instrumental in stopping it uh, one was an ias officer and one was a a media person Uh, not really the regular media person he was a film uh, reviewer there so they got together and this was the times before the internet so they got together and they scuttled the whole plan they went to the court they got a stay order and they were leaking out information about all of that and raising public awareness and this st- and they managed to stop the uh, destruction of that building it was a fascinating story however at the end of that there was an um, elderly man in the audience you know, he kind of was furious he got up and he said look you guys are all talking about the same old stuff everyone knows about bangalore yeah there's a grand soda the atara kacheri and the lal bagh and the kaban park there's a lot more to the city and um, you know you folks who think that you know you are uh, interested in bangalore and you want to 
tell the story of the city ought to go find out those other things which are nice about the city and he said there was this um, he said it's there's this baseline station in the, in bangalore uh, which is a very fascinating structure it was uh, one of the instrumental things in measuring the height of the everest etc etc it's in ruins and nobody knows the story and it's probably the only city in the world which has this kind of an extraordinary heritage in it folks like you should go out uh, see that learn more about it save it and tell the story to the world so it was, it's absolutely accidental that there was that old man there and and i just saw that i had this technical bent of mind which said the moment i heard some trigonometric survey it caught my attention too and bangalore obviously you are from iit i i can yeah, understand yeah well i like not the next one otherwise <laughs> <There you go. laughs> <laughs> it's not so much about iit there's a reason why you went into iit and I, we didn't get in there <laughs> 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 you, you had bad teachers no no the problem with the subject <laughs> i think i think it was with the student <laughs> yeah partly with us i hope my parents are listening to this i just agree to that completely <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so uh, that was uh, that was on a saturday evening and uh, on sunday morning he said it's near makri circle at the ramana marshi park uh, there so i went over there and i found the structure it was just a block of cement with a stone on that wasn't anything remarkable about it but the the place he was talking about was at the other end uh, which is near you know the place that is bhairathi or kannur uh, no as it's known so i thought i had discovered this thing that he was talking about put it up on facebook and i said i got what this is old man was talking about this great stuff and all that and a friend of mine meera ayer she is in uh, intact bangalore so she said no no that's not what it is there's another one at the other end in a place called kannur and uh, you can go find it in the meantime you know, you know i dug out all the some literature about this great trigonometric survey and uh, found that it is you know in the region of bhairathi so went over there looked looked around and i couldn't find it at that point in time there was this um, you know mul- uh, massive complex the multi story complex that's coming up there i forget the name of that uh, just across the gts station so Sa- that's a salapuria something salarpuria something yeah, yeah that's right one of those monsters coming up all over the place so they they had they had excavated uh, they had excavated the whole area for uh, you know, they were just at the level of foundations at that time massive pits i thought that we had lost the structure that uh, so we were talking about and again um, when i shared that info with meera ayer she said you're looking at the wrong side of the road look at the other side of the road and you go find the structure and i went there and i found it and that was in complete shambles it was in ruins uh, locally it's also called the bhut bangla still is called the bhut bangla there oh okay yeah that was because it was um, overgrown with weeds uh, the structure was falling apart and um, it was filth all over the place you couldn't just walk in so easily and that started a uh, started me on a journey of uh, learning the story of the city so while i hated history as i was studying i was fascinated by it when i discovered some you no know, some story of the city of bangalore by accident so uh, you know while well, some people like to say look you know you know a lot about history i say i'm and i prefer to be called an accidental historian because i have no formal training in history in whatsoever no but but uh, i completely agree with you like we have uh, been there and we've seen that place and uh, unless someone tells you that you know look there and go there you you'll definitely miss it you know it's it's somewhere by the corner over there covered by a lot of trees and stuff i mean at least now somebody has taken the effort to kind of put some motor and things together and put it together and clean up the place a little bit better but uh, if i could just take you uh, a little bit deeper into this topic of hours today what was the the necessity or the need of the hour in the 1800s that you know suddenly they woke up and said you know what uh, you know the the lines which we have drawn on our maps right now is not enough and we need an accurate mapping system to be done so firstly uh, now this is a time when the british um, were just uh, were kind of you know beginning their uh, you know rule in india if i may say that so this is a time when um, they had conquered a lot of uh, the country but there were still pockets or islands that remained to be conquered so uh, they were in the conquest mode at that point in time and when you are when you are doing that you really need to understand the lay of the land so where are the um, where are the forests where are the rivers where are the hills where are the you know the uh, enemy forces where they could be hiding what are the best places to get away for them and all of that so the terrain is something which is fundamental for 
any fighting uh, in a body. And the um, the lay of the land so um, in India is vastly different. North India is very different from Southern India, is very different from Eastern India uh, and all of that. So it was very important to know very well local um, geography. One, uh, they were fighting against um, forces who knew this extremely well, especially, you know, in this region, uh, they had to defeat Tipu Sultan, you know, who was, who was the last of the ones they had to defeat to conquer all of peninsular India. So they had, um, you know, they had established their domina- domination in Madras and they had established their domination on the eastern coast and on Mangalore. Sitting right in the middle was Tipu Sultan, the, uh, the Mysore kingdom, right? And Tipu was a master of this, uh, the land. So they, it took them uh, multiple battles, you know, the one, two, the first, second, and third uh, Mysore wars, as they're called. And all the time, every time they fought with him, he was running circles around them. So they would go to a place thinking this is where Tipu is and he would be not be there. They would, and he would attack from somewhere else. So it became very evident to them that they have to understand the geography, the terrain very well. Home advantage. Exactly. That was the military aspect of it. To go out and conquer, they need to understand. They had to have good maps. That's fundamentally what it is that was needed. Two was as they conquer, one of the things that, or rather the reason for conquest is money, right? You basically want wealth. And in, in, the, in the times of the British, the wealth was obviously in terms of, you know, whatever money was hoarded and by the kings and all of that. But more significantly, it was the collection of taxes, right? So you collect money from the land that you own. And essentially, it was taxes. So if you want to collect taxes, then you need to know how much to collect and from whom to collect and, you know, where to collect. Correct, yeah. Right? So even now, uh, even if you read the papers the past few weeks, um, there's a new source of a drone survey in Bangalore. So they want to use drones now to map out the Bangalore city's uh, homes and buildings and start, you know, asking people to pay up. Oh, okay. Based on how much land you own, you got to pay the tax for it. Yeah, yeah tax evasion is pretty common, isn't it? Like if I have a four-story building, I'll say it's two stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's my built-up area, is, let's say 5,000 square foot, I would say it's only 800 square foot. Which is like most Indians do. So That's what we do, right? That's what <laughs> anyone does. <laughs> Who wants to pay money as taxes? <laughs> exactly. Right? Okay. So for them to get a fair idea of the money that they were to receive, they would have to have an understanding of the geography correct you know how much of the land is um, wetland how much of the land is uh, dry land which is cultivable land what what is it in orchards are all kinds of data is required because you, uh, you you basically levy taxes based on the nature of the land on wetland you would be growing sugarcane or paddy which is a which is a rich uh, crop correct on a dry land you would be growing ragi or something else which is uh, not so rich so you the, the taxes you would ask for the money you would ask for is different. So you need to understand that. And just like you said, um, they had massive problems in trying to figure out how much money am I really supposed to get from, let's say, the Taluk of Bangalore. Right. They would think that there seems to be a big land, you know, rich land. I need to get, let's say, just for example, a lakh rupees. And then people would show up and then say, you know, you can get only 10,000 10, rupees because I don't own that, that much land. And uh, much of my the, the land I use is wasteland. You know, or much of the land that has uh, that I own today has been gifted. It's supposed to be tax-free land that I got from, uh, you know, from the kings of history. Yes. So you can't just show up today and say, look, you know, tax-free, tax-exempt land is now taxable. I'm not going to give you all that. So there were those issues, and that's why they wanted detailed maps of the, uh, you know, the country. And that's the uh, r- reason for a foreigner to come here and then start an exercise, yeah, mapping exercise. I think that's a very classic British move. I think even the railways were started just to pillage and transport goods from interior of India to both cities. But I think this has a far more accurate and far more far-reaching benefit even till today. No, not true, uh, because it's um, it's got lots of uh, others, uh, this one as well. Even in the 10th century, uh, when the Cholas went about, just like the Britishers conquering you know, a lot of areas in India, they had the same problem and they did more or less the same thing. Wow. Yeah. So they did do a surveys in those days as well. Not the kind of surveys that we are talking about today, uh, 
Uh, but land categorization and quantification is an old problem for any conqueror. So we understand the, the motive behind this particular mega survey that's called the Great Intrigonometrical Survey of India. So how did it actually start about whose brainwave was this and yes. what was the method- methodology done and, and why did it take 130 years to complete? That is the astronomical number which I still can't understand. Okay, excellent. So how did it start? So when Tipu was defeated in 1799, a part of the uh, British army soldiers who um, you know, who were fighting against him, uh, the contingent was headed by a Colonel Willesley. And uh, in that was one man who was called Major Lambton. So this Lambton was a strange guy. He was actually a surveyor uh, by qualification. And um, he had some knowledge about directions and you know, moving around uh, in, during the night and all that. So when uh, Wellesley was headed uh, towards Sri Rangpatna, uh, supposed to attack Tipu Sultan at some certain location, uh, this man called um, Major Lambton, this is happening uh, no, late in the night, um, in the darkness, in the cover of darkness. So Major Lambton actually notices that they were headed in the direction opposite to which they were supposed to go. So let's say they were, uh, let's say they were supposed to go north. And then looking up at the stars, he figured they were not going north, but they were going south. Oh, okay. okay. So what he did was he sent word uh, to his superior officer, a man called uh, Baird, saying that, look, uh, we're going in the wrong direction. I think you guys need to stop and check. They don't listen to him at first, but then, you know, the message goes right up to Wellesley. And uh, Wellesley, after a while, gets a little bit of uh, suspicious about it. Then asks someone to strike a match and using a compass, find out which direction they're really walking. They discovered that uh, this man Lambton is right. Now, unlike Lambton, who has a little bit of idea about the stars and navigation and all of that, the rest of the people there, including Wellesley, are really, they're all fighting men. They don't know, understand much of this uh, navigation and all that. So this man gets suddenly, you know, um, very famous as that great guy who knows a lot about mathematics and you know, navigation and all that. He marks himself as um, someone who, who's a wizard of types there. So after the defeat um, Tipu Sultan, this man Lambton comes back to Bangalore and um, he hits upon this idea, says, uh, sends a proposal over and says, look, uh, we've been having a lot of trouble uh, finding our way around here, fighting the local uh, kings and chiefs. We have to get better maps of this country. And um, I have an idea of how to develop very precise maps. So he's a surveyor by study as well as by profession earlier. So he says, look, I know this thing called trigonometry is a great way and the lay of the land here in terms of, you know, hills and uh, all of that is perfectly suited for surveying using this technique and developing maps of this country and um, puts a number on the uh, project and then sends it across to uh, Wellesley in Madras. And uh, Wellesley likes the idea and agrees to fund it. That's how the project starts. But there's also a little bit about that he had ulterior motives. Like it was not just the fact that he wanted this, but he wanted the fame also. So can you shed some light on that? Right. So now developing or doing a trigonometric survey can help in two ways. One is developing the map of the region that you are surveying. And the second is that at that time in in the 1800s, the scientific problem all the top scientists of the world were working on is in trying to understand the shape and the size of the earth. Oh, okay. So they had figured that the world was not flat and it was rounded because they were navigating around the world and all of that. However, they had no clear idea of really the shape of the earth. Now, you know, we are all taught in school saying it's flattened at the poles, bulging at the equator and all of that stuff. However, that wasn't very clear. Whether it was a perfect globe, whether it was, um, you know, whether stretched at the poles or whether it was bulging at the poles, all this was unclear. And what exactly was the size of the earth in terms of the diameter or the radius of the earth was not known. People had various numbers there. It wasn't very precisely known. So the survey of, uh, the trigonometric survey is essentially trying to, you know, go up north or south. And as you're doing it, if it's a curved object, you can actually, uh, based on the, you know, the arc, so you're moving along an arc on the on the on the sphere or the globe, right? So based on the arc, you can figure out what is the angle subtended and what's the radius of the uh, um, of the globe that you're surveying. So indirectly, you would actually you know indirectly you would actually be um, also be able to calculate the radius of the Earth at the points you're surveying. So if you keep going up from the equator, let's say just theoretically up to the pole, and you find the radius at various points is changing as you go up north. That means you are able to say it's not a sphere or it's flattened at the poles 
or it's bulging at the poles or whatever it is that you know it is that's how you can do de- determine the so it gave us a better idea of the shape of the earth yeah it, it gave um, a very good idea of the shape and size of the earth and this man lampton was also a contender in that race for being the person who you know deduces that so this was a race that was going on all across the world so the french in, in the african region the spanish and the portuguese in uh, south america the british here and the germans in uh, south africa they were all going out in different parts of the world trying to conquer the races right so scientists in all of these countries were trying to solve the same problem oh okay okay so every every so uh, few months or years there would be a new paper saying look we figured it out this is the shape of the earth this is the better more exact value of the size of the earth and all of that so lampton was very eager to be the one to get that kind of uh, recognition okay. so his proposal was while it was uh, publicly to kind of say i'll help develop maps of southern india behind the idea was his idea was his uh, dream to also publish a paper saying look i figured the size the exact size and shape of the earth so this is a project uh, if you want to understand and appreciate uh, much like development of the covid vaccine last year or the mission to pluto or you know any of these uh, mapping of the human genome all those big science projects that you know the scientists of the world want to work on and claim to fame as having solved right so this was a similar project at that time this just sounds like such a fascinating rabbit hole that we're going into so don't be too scared about trigonometry or math or anything like that but we'll find more about how lambden actually went about this whole survey and why it took 130 years we'll be back after a quick break <laughs> You're listening to the Old Couple Podcast. Old Couple Podcast, a Pandemia Inc. production. Are you ready? A friendly fireside chat with friends, where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion, punctuated with a laugh or two. Check it out. Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. And we are back, and with us we have the accidental historian, Mr. Uday Kumar, and who is just taking us through the whole story of how the Great Trigonometrical Survey was conducted back in the 1800s. So, sir, now we know who Lampton was and what his motives were in, um, you know, getting this whole done. He sold the whole economic idea to the Queen and got permission to, you know, get this whole mapping and survey done. But um, why is bangalore important to this story and uh, what was the process he then took to you know go about the survey so um why is bangalore important because this is the place where the whole exercise started so when uh, lampton proposed that you know he undertake the survey he said you are sitting here at dodgunta which is in mansur and his proposal was accepted and funding was granted so he started his uh, surveying activities from here in bangalore so the first of which was he marked something called a baseline so the baseline is fundamentally a basis line it's a basis for starting the entire project itself so he very excruciating detail you measure a, a line on the ground and the line he measured was between two points one was at lingrajpuram and the other was at agara on the silk board oh okay yeah so this baseline he measured you know, over 57 days wow that's a long time to measure a line yeah so if you walk that distance today it'll probably take you even if you're a slow walker about 4 to 5 hours at most okay but it took them 57 days to cover that distance because they were measuring the distance between those two points one at lingrajpuram and the other at agara to an extraordinary amount of uh, precision and what they were measuring was actually i'm just going to throw a number um, it's not exact uh, right now let's say they were measuring a, li- a, a distance of about 7534.407 feet so a thousands of a feet they were measuring it to 0.407 feet which will be like a 0.01 inch or 0.02 inch a distance of about 7 and a half miles a distance of 7 and a half miles is measured precisely to a thousandth of an of a foot and it's like extraordinarily minute right yes and for those of you who think that's not such a big number they didn't have calculators those days there was no mobile phone so no gps <laughs> there was no GPS. there was no gps there was nothing to tell you you know there's nothing like google maps so uh, the exact number that they actually got was 39867.706 feet hmm. 
Yeah, let's let me repeat that. It's 39,867.706 feet between a point in Lingarajpuram and a point in Nagara. And because they wanted this kind of precision, that is why they, it took them 57 days to measure it. And how they measure it is, you love this if you are a, you know, love, like cricket. They used chains, which were the same length as a cricket pitch. How long is a cricket pitch? Do you remember that? 22 and a half yards. Or 22 yards. Okay. So 22 yards is the length of a chain. It's a, it's a chain because you know, it needs to be strong and rigid and all of that. So they stretch it taut between two points and the end points they mark it. And, you know, they mark it with a plumb line. A plumb line is just something heavy you drop down on the ground and wherever it strikes, that's the point. And that's one measure. Then they move further up. They measure the second 22 yards. The third 22 yards, they go on. If you guys remember when you're playing kids, the way we measured, uh, you know, the uh, crease was a foot. A foot, yeah, one foot length. Yeah. So it's the same thing now you're using 22 yard chains. And then you go 22 yards at a time and then you measure up ending whatever that number was. You know that I said 39,867.7706 feet. Okay. And this is critical for the rest of the exercise. So Lambton did this measure here in Bangalore. And these marks he left, wherever he measured, they would build small mounds to indicate, you know, this is the point that we started, this is the point we stopped, and all of that. Those marks are kind of permanent marks. They're still there in Bangalore. And what's the big deal about this in a city like Bangalore is that this is a city which is now known for its science and technology capabilities. So like all cities have a you know, label that go with them. Bombay is the financial capital. Delhi is the political capital. Or Kanchipuram is the place you go for silk saris. Correct. Ramnagar for toys. Bangalore is the place where you go for science and technology. This is where the, this is the engineer's capital of the world today. And precise measurement is actually an engineering task. So for science and technology capital of the world, a project like this that started here and then spread over 130 years and covered every nook and corner of the subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of this region, and help develop inch perfect maps. You understand the word inch perfect now because they were measuring to a thousandth of a foot. So the maps were inch perfect. They could tell exactly, for example, between a point here in Bangalore at Makri Circle and a point on the race course in Gindi, Madras, two inches. They could say it was exactly these many inches. That's why it's such an extraordinary uh, project. And that's why it's so significant for Bangaloreans. So... Major Lambton started uh, his measurement from Lingarajpuram uh, and all the way to Arakere. And he measured it to a thousandth of a feet, as you uh, earlier mentioned. Now, where does trigonometry come into play? I mean, this is just one measure. So were they sitting and measuring every time, spending 57 days or more uh, doing it? Yeah, I hope Hashi stays uh, to listen to, uh, to this. I'm going to try and wrap my head around this. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your eyes wide open. It's not as bad as you, you know you thought it is. Um, so it's uh, fairly simple. If you know a triangle, and this is eight standard mathematics, I'm not going to go any more than that. That's about all that's required. I'm being a doctor, I guess he did get past eight standard. <laughs> We're hoping so. It's great. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so a triangle has three sides and three angles, right? Correct. So there's three sides and the three interior angles define a triangle precisely. Now, um, for you don't need three the, the lengths of the three sides and all the three angles really to kind of exactly mark out a triangle. Hmm. Any three of them, it's two sides and an angle or two angles and a side, all of that, more than enough to define precisely an angle, uh, triangle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is where the, uh, the trigonometry comes in. So it doesn't matter if you don't understand what I'm going to say now. Just let's just say there is something called a sine of an angle. Okay, so there's a basic formula most of us learn and do understand. It's called a by sine a equal to b by sine b equal to c by sine c, where the a b c is the small a b c's are essentially the lengths of the three sides of a triangle, and the angles are a b c capital a b c's. So a small a by a sine a is equal to b by sine b. So what they do is they measure a first a length, and that length is called as the baseline. 
And that's in this case that you're talking about was between Lingarajpuram and Agara. So that's the baseline. That's one side of a triangle. And then what they do is, the reason they pick those two points, Lingarajpuram and Agara, where they were slightly elevated points. Okay. There's an unobstructed view to these places from the surroundings. So what they do is they go to another point. Let's for this example say Makri Circle. They stand there and they use a telescope. And you have somebody standing at Lingrajpuram at that point with a flag staff. Make it more clear. And you have somebody standing at Agara with a flag staff there. Sitting in Makri Circle, I point my telescope at the, at the flag staff in uh, Lingrajpuram. And then I rotate it, uh, rotate the telescope and uh, to the other point in Agara. And then as I'm rotating it, I'm also noticing what angle is being covered. So you know, if I go in a direction like a hands of a clock, it's just pivoting around. So I can always measure the angle, right? So I measure one angle and then I go to another point. Let's say I go to um, one of these Lingrajpura points itself. And then I check out what's the angle between Agara and Makri Circle. So I, I measure two angles and I measure a length. Now I got every distance uh, there without having to physically measure it. Using that formula, I figure the distance between uh, Krishnajpuram, I'm sorry, Lingrajpuram and Makri Circle. I calculate that using the formula. Then I calculate the distance between Agara and uh, Makri Circle using the formula. Because I, I got one side of a triangle and I measured two angles. I can I can now calculate every other uh, you know, side of the triangle as well as the interior angles. Wow, wow. So the wow. first time it's a linear measurement, that is you use a chain and then you you measure it, you take a long you know, time to measure it accurately and all that. That's a painstaking process. But measuring angles is very simple. Once I get one triangle, I got every dimension of the triangle, then go to a new point, measure two new angles for that and I, I get a second triangle, then I go to a third triangle, I do a fourth triangle and just I go on and on and on. So the first measure is a linear measure. The rest of them are angular measures. And all of the rest of it is all just calculations, which is where the trigonometry part comes in. And that trigonometry part is that simple formula of A by sine A equal to B by sine B equal to C by sine C. And the reason it's called a trigonometric survey is you're doing the entire survey using simple uh, mathematics or basic trigonometry. That's brilliant. Ashish, understood? <laughs> Wake me up in the middle of the night and I'll tell you A by sine A is equal to B by sine P is equal to C by sine C. Sine See, C. why didn't my math teacher just teach me this, you know? I would have figured it all out. Yeah, that's great. But sir, I, I'm sure the, I mean, we're making it sound far more easier. I mean, like, you know, that they just measured one line and, you know, use the test. Right. Because... From what I heard was those telescopes were not really like what we think, you know, a tripod with a telescope. Yeah, well, well, the idea, the concept is very basic. Nothing more complex than that. However, what they were doing is that they were using very powerful telescopes. So they used um, telescopes which had a magnification of 65, which means an object at 65 foot away would look like it is just one foot away. Mm -hmm. Right. And they chose uh, the highest points in the region and the highest points of the region allows you to look the farthest uh, distance out in the horizon. Correct. So if you're on level ground, you see uh, to some distance as you keep going up, you kind of see further out and further out and further out. As you're seeing, seeing further out, if you want to see an object that far out, obviously you need a powerful telescope. Yes. The more powerful the telescope, Obviously, the more um, it's not something you can hold by hand. You need some equipment to hold it, right? The farther the out you can see, the heavier the telescope, and therefore heavier the structure that holds that telescope itself. Also, remember you are taking measurements. So you are, every time you rotate the telescope, there's a scale underneath which is showing how how much you rotated this telescope by. And also remember that you are measuring everything to extraordinary amounts of you know, precision. So the structure itself should be very stable and very robust, right? So if, if it's not robust, that means what you're measuring is going to be in, inaccurate. Yeah, then there's no point in having you know, accurate maps at all. Guys like Tipu Sultan can always run circles around you. If you think there's a hillock there, and then you go there and you find plain level land, obviously it's not no use in doing a survey like that. So these uh, telescopes, actually the uh, technical name for it is a theodolite. It's a telescope mounted on a scale. The one that was used by Lambton was about six foot tall. Oh, wow. Yeah, and weighed half a ton. 500 kgs. Wow. Yes, half a ton in British pounds. Almost the same, not very different. Yeah. So it was a half a ton equipment, extraordinarily precise. So it had to be built, um, to, you know, it had to add brass in it, a lot of steel in it and all of that. Made it very heavy and that's why it was half a ton. So they had to lug this around all over the country and they chose elevated points. What's an elevated point? 
height of uh, let's say the summit of Savandurga or Nandi or uh, the Gopra of a temple. Yeah, right. So um, essentially also meant they also had to work with the weather, right? So if you want to sight something very far away, you need pretty good visibility when you're doing it. Smoke, fog, rain, clouds, all of that tend to you know, spoil your measurement. So they had to wait for days on end. Imagine this situation. Let's say you're sitting on top of Savandurga is not so far away from here. So sitting in Savandurga, they would measure someone holding a flagstaff at Chamundi Hills, which is in Mysore. Okay. The other measurement would be to the uh, uh, Shavan Balgola. That's in Hassan. It's near, it's in Hassan district. Yeah. That's far. That far. So you really need to have clear, 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 good visibility. You know, that, that doesn't happen every day. So it takes um, many days for them to get one reading. And also they're not happy doing one reading because... It's not precise, right? So you want to take multiple readings, average it out, make sure that, you know, whatever errors that you have, you know, negligible or you minimize it and all of that. So it took time for that reason. It also took a lot of people. I can imagine. I mean, just thinking about the distance between here to Chamundi Hills, it, I mean, it's it's in it's like 130, 150 kilometers. Yeah. And again, to Shauna Balgola, it's similar, if, if not more. What I'm just thinking, the amount of coordination they, they needed to have. Oh, yeah, they don't have walking or... And he looks through the telescope and the guy is not lifting this pole and sitting over there yeah. at the precise time uh, when the weather is a uh, thing and probably taking a ciggy break or, or just went down the hill. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So uh, it often took many nights and many days for them. And once they, got, once they were able to sight and got a reading, they would send word and say, okay, now move over to the other place. That itself probably took them a few days. This was much before they got that uh, mobile phones and you know, <laughs> messaging and all of that. You're absolutely right. And, and these teams uh, often ran into hundreds. At one time, the largest of the teams they had was about 800 people because the logistics of all that use in, you know, taking all this heavy equipment around and that itself was a task. So they needed elephants, horses, you know, they had bullock carts and all of that. And then they had to have supporting staff, the coolies, uh, obviously, to lug this all this around. If they needed to be fed, so you had to have cooks. And all these people had to be paid, so you had to have accountants. And and this was the days when, um, you know, obviously, they couldn't freely roam around as well. So they had to have their own soldiers for protections too. And having all these teams, they had to go through all kinds of terrain. They had to cross rivers, they had to cross forests, they had to climb hill, hills and all of that, which also meant they all needed some families. So it, it, was, it was an expedition of sorts, team of 800 moving around, setting up camp, doing things and covering the length and breadth of the country. Yeah, there was there's also the, the thing that they lost a lot of lives um, doing this. Right. So obviously, uh, not taking, around, taking all this equipment around is not so easy. So the accidents were common, number one. And um, disease. They were living in um, places which were unhygienic. They didn't have the best of medical um, care at that time. And uh, food, obviously, as well. And, uh, and there were insects and there were snakes and there were all mosquitoes and there were all of that as well. So the average life expectancy of a British surveyor was 50 years at that time. So if you test 50 and you were a surveyor, then you were already you know, burnt out. You, you, you had not, not, not many years. Not to many live. years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was one. So the uh, story that is, um, is that when the British started this, and this is a statement made by the Queen, so when she was updated about the, you know, the survey and the project and all that, and how many lives it had cost, she, she remarked that uh, she had lost more lives in this project than soldiers in all the battles that England had fought for. Wow. So that was one. And the other statement was that she had lost more land through this project than all the battles that her soldiers had lost. <laughs> <laughs> because of the accuracy of the measurement. Because of the accuracy of the project. So she, she thought she owned massive amounts of land and when they surveyed that she figured it wasn't that much. Correct, correct. <laughs> nice. I also read that um, using this uh, GTS, that's a great trigonometrical survey, uh, that is how the height of Mount Everest was accurately measured, right. which we even refer to today as, as a measurement. Is that true? Right. So uh, what happened was Lambton, when he started his survey, it was supposed to be a coast-to-coast -coast survey. That's Madras to Mangalore was how we titled it. And he finished the Madras to Mangalore thing and going down to uh, Kanyakumari. And uh, once that was done, uh, he also got permission to proceed up north. 
So he went up to Nagpur, which is almost central India, and he had surveyed the whole region there. And he he passed away in Nagpur. By that time, the the uh, British had actually decided they would extend this to the entire region they had conquered. So they went further up. They went uh, northwest up to Afghanistan. They went to Nepal. They went to Tibet. They went to the Bangladesh region. So they spun off these uh, subsidiary projects, which kind of went on all over the place. They went went right up to the Himalayas. And they were surveying the Himalayas at two at that point in time. Himalayas means automatically, you know, also determining the height of the peaks and all of that, right? So at that time, they also determined the height of the Everest. But uh, how would they do that? I mean, like... I mean, it wasn't climbed until 1953. Yeah, but we are doing calculations, right? You don't need to go on top. You're just taking angles. You don't have to go on top. A little bit more sophisticated trigonometry and all that. And they could figure it out without having to go on top. Yeah, they're measuring vertical angles. They're measuring vertical angles and all of that as well. The calculating for unknowns and all that. I wouldn't want to scare away Ashish here. Yeah, uh, they were doing. Let's, let's keep yeah, it. They were doing. They were doing sophisticated, much more sophisticated stuff, which allowed them to calculate the height of Mount Everest. Uh, it was actually calculated by one of the you know the term that you used was. Remember, they had no computers. They had people there who were called computers, whose job was to use the data and calculate results. They were computing things. So they were actually called computers. Yeah, that was my other question, which I wanted to ask you because there's a lot of data which are gathering over here, but uh, I'm sure the maths is not going to be easy Yeah, because if you're going to measure a certain distance, there's a point after which, because of the curvature, you're not going to get an accurate angle using your telescopes, etc. So you need to go and draw another line somewhere else. And then, so that's why I think we have, I don't know how many baselines, but they, they drew a certain amount of baselines everywhere to take into consideration the curvature of the earth. You're absolutely right. So as they progress further and further away, the magnitude of the error in these calculations was getting higher. So in order to correct that, you know, in, in some, some places further out, let's say 500 kilometers up out from Bangalore, they would redo the baseline exercise, remeasure a baseline in that point and use that as a reference for, you know, branching out from there. So in this way, uh, there were many baselines. At one time, they had 11 baselines across the country and it changed over a period of time. So just back to the story of Everest a little bit. So the guy who actually calculated it uh, was a person by name Sikda. Okay, he was a Bengali. He was a mathematical genius and um, known for very fast and precise calculations and all that. So he calculated the height of Everest to be a certain number, okay, which was very, very close to a round number, which is like 28,000 feet or whatever. And then he kind of said, look, uh, if I go and tell this and give this my number to my boss, He's going to think I faked it. <laughs> you can't get a number as precise as 28,000 feet you know, by calculation, right? Correct. So he said, obviously, you know, boss is not going to believe it. So what he does is just he kind of makes it, uh, turns it around, says 28 feet, 28,028 feet, which is not his calculation because his books show something else. But he goes and reports to this to his boss saying, uh, this is the calculation. And that man says, great. Now, the f- interesting part is that with all the satellites today and all of that, we now know the his calculated height to be 20 foot off. Really? So uh, imagine not being able to climb Everest. They climbed it much, much, almost 100 years later after that. He calculates it using these uh, mathematical formulas to be 20 foot off from what we know it to be today using a zillion satellites and a zillion calculations and supercomputers and all of that. So that's the precision of this project. And what you're calculating it is from, let's say, sea level is Madras. So the height of Mount Everest from Madras, that's 20 foot off is what they got as the height of Everest. That's why it's such a fantastic project. That's like mind-blowingly fascinating. And these monuments which we're seeing in our backyards, they were to house what? The the telescope? Yes, the one that you saw at Kannur. That's that's one end of a baseline. Unfortunately, Lambton's baseline endpoints have been destroyed. The one, the one at Lingrajpuram, is, uh, there's a water tank sitting there now. A BWSSB ground level reservoir is sitting there. And the other endpoint at Agara is essentially a training track for the army. Uh, so they've been lost. However, subsequently, uh, they were remeasuring these baselines. In 1865 in Bangalore, they redid a new baseline. And what you saw in Kannur is the end point of that. That's called the northeast end point because it's in the northeastern direction. The other one is at Mekri Circle, the Ramanamarshi Park. That's the southwest end point. Uh, because there were baselines, those end points had to be marked very, very precisely. So they 
they put something called a mark stone, which is a granite stone with a crosshair marked on that and a hole in the center. That was a mounting point for the theodolite that you, you know you said the telescope. You're right. And because it was something so holy, they also built a beautiful, nice stone structure around it to protect it from you know, both uh, man and nature. This, this is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the marks that we have in the city of Bangalore. Other than this, we have a lot of other smaller uh, marks, which are called be- you know, benchmarks and other places all over the city. Okay. They're all kind of think of it as milestones or marks left from yesteryears from that project. And they're in fascinating places. So if you've seen um, Trinity Church at the end of MG Road, on the steps that are li- you know, leading up to the church, on the second step, you will find a mark there. And that's a, that's, a, that's a reference mark left from the GTS survey. What? Really? Yeah, absolutely. I'm and sure so many people have stepped on that every Sunday and never bothered. You know, they probably thought it's a cross or something. <laughs> yeah, and um, at Coven Park, you have the Queen statue, right? Yes. At the pedestal, on, on the pedestal of the statue, you have a mark there called the G, you know, left from the GTS survey. And you have lots of such things. The, at the Kempegoda Tower in uh, Makri Circle, the more famous uh, Kempegoda Tower, has three such marks left there. Last week, I was at the Baswangudi Bull Temple. Right on the floor of the temple by the Baswa, there's a GTS mark left there. Okay, So these are all reference points. And uh, they chose these points because they were more permanent and less susceptible to uh, you know, wear and tear and damage. It's not so easy to raise a church or a temple or you know a Kempegoda Tower and places like that. Yeah. So these marks are all over the city. In some situations, they are in funny places as well. So railway platforms were a good place to measure and leave a mark on. And railway place, railway platforms, if you see, usually also carry the board that says cantonment railway station, so many meters above sea level. Cut party say, you know, railway station, so many meters above sea level. That's a reference point, right? So what happens is that um, stations change. You add lines, you change platforms, you know, you move the building around and all that. Nevertheless, because there is this mark left, they usually don't touch it. They leave that part of it intact without knowing what it stands for often. So right now, if you go to Kiarpuram uh, railway station, and a lot of trains start there today, find your way to the um, men's um, public toilet. Right opposite the tyloid, there is a mark with a stone there which says GTS benchmark. On it. My <laughs> it used to be It used to be the station master's cabin at one time. Just oh, wow. in front of the station master's <laughs> office, they left it. Now the whole platform shifted up and, you know, it's the toilet sitting there. So there are marks all over the city. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these marks uh, have also been lost. So there were many of these uh, marks that were at the end of Brigade Road, Cavalry Road. A lot of these roads also carried that. Now in all the rebuilding and construction, they've all been lost. There are, well, there's no scientific value to it today, except there's a huge heritage value to it. I think for me, I think, you know, when I heard the story myself, it was just as simple as that. Just the fact that, you know, there was something which was really significant at one point of time has been forgotten by a generation. And uh, and when you learn about its significance, it gives you a completely different understanding of why and how and and just the the difficulty which they went through to go about doing this at a period where, you know, there was no proper terrain, there were forests, sickness, diseases, there's a humongous, humongous task. And it just shows you again, you know, that how Indians are, how much they can do with so little, you know, under the worst circumstances, we do a lot of things. And there's a piece of history over here for me, you know, that says that we shouldn't forget, you know, and we should remember this. You, you shouldn't forget. I absolutely agree with you. I also think that you shouldn't forget it because you're. it's very important in shaping the future as well. And how that is, is um, like I said, today, Uh, Bangalore is not just the science and technology capital for India. It's also a science and technology capital in many ways for the world. Any product you can think of, like the software that we're using today or the microphones or what we use or the cars we drive or the vaccines that we are using today, the jet engines, the medical equipment, CT machines, MRI machines, PET scan machines, name all of them. All of them have a Bangalore contribution, significant Bangalore contribution today. Whether it's the G's or the Siemens or the ABB's or name the company or the Biocons, all of them 
are working out from Bangalore. In many ways, we are shaping the future sitting out here. However, if you could just imagine, look, this kind of precise work was done here from Bangalore. And, you know, this is the outcome of that. Let's say that you just take out, let's say, a Honeywell team or somebody, you know, some other team over there. And say, look, this is the place you're working out from. This is the results that have come out of this. I think you drive home a message of quality right. and precision and seriousness to the work that you do. You're just not building another product for the world. It's not a second rate, it's not a second rate product you are developing from a second rate place. This is a baseline that you need to measure up to. If they could measure the height of Everest to 20 feet sitting from Bangalore, starting from Bangalore, you can definitely send out a satellite to uh, anywhere on the universe. Yeah. And ho- expect it to land there. Which we are on our way of doing. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So it's not just knowing the past, it's also shaping the future. And hats off to all people like you who have taken keen interest in this and and ensuring of both spreading the word, the good word of conservation, but also taking time out, going through all the documents and tracking these places down and, and renovating it. I think hats off to you and your team and everybody across India who are doing similar projects like this to conserve this rich history and tradition that we have in our country, which we often do not see when we are caught up in the vortex of life. And I hope this particular chat uh, has inspired a lot more accidental historians to come up in the future. So thank you so much, Mr. Vidya Kumar, for joining us on the Odd Couple podcast and shedding light on this fascinating story that you've told us this evening. Thank you so much. And I'm sure had Ashish been taken to that place and told, explain the trigonometry you know, there, I bet he would love mathematics today. No, I definitely <laughs> will join you. And I, I, I urge all our, all our listeners to, you know, Check out Mr. Uday's uh, bio and he does a lot of these walks around uh, Bangalore uh, where he talks about a lot of inscription stones which are there around Bangalore, uh, which talks about the history of Bangalore and where it originated from and which is uh, absolutely another beautiful story and and i'm sure we have to get him back you know to to talk about that and tell that story because that's a next level story absolutely so until then tune into the odd couple podcast we leave all the details of the walks as well as the coordinates if i may use the word of forms to their kumar in our show notes so Thank you so much. Tune in next fortnight for our anniversary show uh, because it would be one year since the Odd Couple podcast launched and we are honored to have Mr. Dhyay Kumar on the penultimate show of the Odd Couple podcast. Thank you. My honor. Thank you so much. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.